Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Bible in Order Faith Friday special edition here with my friend Jack LaFountain. Jack is a Vietnam veteran, an ordained minister, a Bible teacher. After serving as a hospice chaplain, he became a registered nurse. He retired following an injury and began writing. He is now the author of 16 books, including the Man of God series. That's Man with Two Ends. Jack LaFountain, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you, David. I'm glad glad to be here. I love, yeah. always love talking about writing books. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm so honored to be able to do this interview for a second time because we had some technology glitches the first time around. Can you share, um, why did you write the Man of God books for those who aren't familiar? Well, the, the, the Man of God books are really... Um, were kind of a, a big departure from what I was writing. Uh, I got into writing to be published. I, I what drew me in there. Uh, I got into a um, an organization. They had with a Christmas ghost story competition every year, and I was submitting to those. And it, just the writing kind of then became a lot of ghost stories, uh, paranormal things, and I was writing a lot of that. And uh, which I, I still do. Uh, in fact, just finished uh, a num number six book in a series, paranormal series, uh, wow. two days ago. Um, but uh, I'm, you know, uh, I was just interested in in books that addressed uh, men of God, you know, men that that were servants, you know, of the Lord and, um, something that they would like to read because I looked through a lot of things and I didn't find a lot that I wanted to read. Uh, and so being a big Western fan, that's kind of where I went with that. Uh, picked out 1870s Wyoming and, uh, put a fellow who, uh, had had some trouble in his past and had overcome that, uh, became a frontier preacher put him in that situation and uh it just it worked well i enjoyed writing it and mm -hmm. uh like i said that i wanted i wanted to do something that that men would like to read christian men uh because i didn't find a lot of that and i heard one time that you know if you if you think of a book that you'd like to read and you can't find it out there then that means you're supposed to write it so uh awesome I kind of took that on when I first, when I did the first man of God book, the editor read it and said, she, she told me, um, women are going to love the first half of this book and men are going to love the second half. So <laughs> what she said, that, that really doesn't work well. Uh, so pick one or the other. Let's, let's write it for the ladies, which wasn't really my goal, but I, okay, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, because it still had, you know, still had some in it. So I rewrote it, uh, rewrote the second half of it anyways, uh, kind of with leaning more towards romance and that kind of thing that women might be interested in. And we put the book, we, we, we got done with it. We put the book out to some, some readers, some, some Christian women to read. And the, re the replies we got back were, were almost identical from all three that we sent it to. Um, yes, I really like it, but, <laughs> and the but was, it doesn't fit in the sort of the Harlequin romance pattern or the, you know, the Hallmark okay. movie kind of pattern. It yeah. doesn't follow that pattern. So that was a negative. So we, we got back that response and the editor said, okay, uh, go ahead and write it for the guys. So I re rewrote it again, uh, more for men. And, and the response I got from men was, uh, Hey, this is a, you know, it's, it's a Christian book. It's, it's a Western and it's not a Western disguised as a romance. So they, you know, they, they liked it. And so I, it ended, ended up with a couple of more actually, um, I had intended to stop after the second book and the editor that I have now says, no, no way. We're, we're doing a third book. <laughs> and I said, okay, we'll, we'll do a trilogy and then we'll be, we'll be done. And we got done with the third one. And then she said, no, we're not done. Uh, I said, but I've told, I've told Kit man, he's the, he's the, the, um, the main character in the book. 
Uh, again, the man with two ends. Anyways, Kip Man, I said, I've told Kip Man's story. And uh, so I don't know that there's any more to tell. And her reply to that was, yes, but you've created this entire town and all these characters. Uh, you've got lots of people to write about, you know, lots of stories mm. to do. They, you know, uh, will, which all fit into the town. And well, OK, I guess so. And actually, since I finished the book uh, a couple of days ago, I, I am starting on book number four in the Man of God series, probably this afternoon. <laughs> I know people are going to be excited to lay their hands on that. Is it? Is there any way to predict how long it's going to take for that to for that book to come out? Uh, not exactly. the The first three books that I uh, Man of God books that I wrote, uh, I did them. There's a sort of a I don't know whether it's na it's a national organization, uh, and it's uh, they. They have what they call National Novel Writers Month, which NaNoWriMo is what they call it. And every November, the, they have a challenge, and the challenge is to write a 50,000-word novel in the 30 days of November. Mm. And the first three Man of God books were part of that. I, I got that challenge through uh, for three years in a row. I, I was supposed to start on the fourth. I do the fourth one this November, and that didn't happen. I had a... I had one book that I was editing that we were in a hurry to get out. And then I was, of course, I was working on one other one of my own. Uh, so uh, my editor says that I've got till the end of December to get this book written. Wow. Uh, that is mind we'll blowing. <laughs> that is mind blowing. I, I hope, blowing. hope we can Goodness. make it by then. And so it, at, once I get it written, of course, then it's got, it's got to be edited and things. So, it, you know, maybe maybe sometime the end of January, 1st of February, that one will show up. Okay. So, so for those listening, January, 2024, potentially February, 2024, most yeah. likely that's uh, amazing. That's mind blowing to me. Jack, can you talk a little bit about how the man of God series is different from some of your other writings? You did, you did mention it's, it's a Western, it's uh, got romance and, in there, there's a little bit of something for everybody, but how does it vary from your other writings? Well, probably the biggest thing when I've people do that, I've you know, I was I was ordained and I was you know taught Sunday school and Bible studies and things. And when the when the I've got another series is called the people call it the Moon series because all the titles have moon in them. And they have to do with werewolves and voodoo and zombies and all kinds of things. But um, people saw some of those covers and they said, oh, no, I can't. You know, I, I'm not reading that. And right. How, and the question always was, how can you as as a Christian write those books? And uh, my answer was always, well, it's very easy to do um, because it, they're all about the battle between good and evil which essentially the man of God books are as well. There's still a, a, a battle between good and evil goes on in each book, but uh, for a, a large part, uh, some of the battle goes on more internally with the characters uh, mm. than in some of the other books, whatever um, monsters or giants whatever they have to battle a lot of those are are internal things they're spiritual things uh that they have to overcome uh the original the, the first book in the series is called redemption and the the whole thing hinges on the idea kit man was a a deserter from the confederate army uh after he deserted from the army he joined up with a a, a group of fellows and they were robbing banks uh still saying they were serving the their cause but they they were keeping the money for themselves but um they were robbing banks and you know on the border states and things and um what happened was one night after um drinking a bit too much uh, uh a fellow comes up and and taps him on the shoulder to ask directions or whatever and, and he just turns around and shoots him because mm. he just it just sort of a knee jerk reaction, not really any malice intended. In, but the fellow that he shoots down happens to be uh, a local minister, and 
Kit just jumps up and runs, trying to, basically trying to run away from himself. And the first person that he stumbles upon after he's just worn out himself and his horse and uh, the first person he stumbles upon happens to be a um, the dean of a seminary who's out on vacation and he's fishing at the you know on the local river and he ends up spending some time with him uh, becomes a christian actually goes back with him to the um to the seminary and studies and graduates and he doesn't want to leave and the, the dean of the school really wants him to leave he thinks he you know needs to be out there you know doing the Lord's work, but he doesn't want to leave. And one of the reasons he doesn't want to leave is because he's wanted, mm. uh, you know, he's, he knows there's got to be wanted posters out there or somebody's going to recognize him. But the opportunity finally comes to go to this very isolated little town in Wyoming. So he says, okay, you know, I, I, and he goes and he's been there about a year. Uh, he's really, uh, the people of the town really like him. They, you know, they uh, they enjoy his ministry. And then one day his old gang rides into town after kind of getting shot up in a, a, a railroad holdup. And, of course, he, he hasn't told anybody about his past. And now mm -hmm. it all comes to light and he has to deal with that. Hmm. Um, and kind of has to deal with. He also has the sort of the dilemma. He he wants to, them. They want to take over the town. Uh, he wants, and of course, with the with the the people of the town, they want him out of the town. Uh, and one of the things he has to face is that he's not going to you know strap on the the six guns again and go out and fight with them because that's that's his old way of doing things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's part of the, part of the challenge is how to, how to overcome them and get the town back without resorting to, to killing. Yeah. So it's that, it's that transition from acting in the flesh, trying to accomplish our own will to becoming a, a child of God and working by, or warring even by the things of the spirit. I th yeah. I, th I think, it'll, you know, a large part, because part of the, you know, part of it has to do with he's when when new, you know, his 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 history comes out. Uh, a great deal of what he's trying to the message that I'm trying to get across, and he's trying to get across too, is that um, the new man really is a new man. Mm -hmm. That you know, all the old things are passed away, and there's new things now. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, or see, mm. because there's a second book, he does overcome. And his decision when, when that happens is okay. He's got to address his past. He's got the immediate problem solved, but he still has to address his past. So basically he loads up and some friends with town to, from town, uh, decide to go with him because they don't want him to go alone, and he goes and turns himself in for the mm, the killing. Mm -hmm. it goes to trial. Yeah. Wow. And again, well, that's his defense. I'm I'm a new man. You know, I realize that doesn't necessarily let me off, but you know, the plea to the jury is, I'm a new person. Yeah. Jack, would you mind sharing a little bit about how how you are receiving um, the Word of God? Like, <clears throat> I'm not sure how to phrase it, but I mean, do you do you have a regular quiet time or a regular Bible study time that you're that you're like receiving Scripture into who you are, into your mind, into your heart, and then it flows out of you into your books? Does that question even make sense? It does, yeah, I, and I do. I um, generally begin every morning uh, with um, a Bible reading and devotional. Mm -hmm. Spend some time in in meditation on the things that you know that I've read, and um, try to continue that. Also, uh, you know, in some reading, necessary, you know, a kind of a, a way, not necessarily away from scripture, but. 
uh, devotional kind of reading. Uh, I, okay. I love C.S. Lewis. Oh, yeah. I've I've read, you know, I think all of his nonfiction books. I actually bought one of his fiction books to read because I took a college course on him. And well, actually, two: one on his basically on his apologetics, and then one on his fictional writing. And I, I took the course on the fictional writing. I hadn't read any of them. I hadn't read the Chronicles of Narnia. I hadn't read the Space Trilogy, and so now I'm I'm reading some of those and, you know, getting, I, again, the idea, the, the idea comes through in his writing of, uh, there's, you know, some spiritual growth and things. And so, yeah, yeah I, I devote some time to that. Good. And of course, then I, I've been doing, I do a Thursday morning, um, uh, Bible study. So, you know, generally from, getting up Monday morning until I I get to get to the class on Thursday about 11 o'clock uh, a lot of that times given uh, given mm -hmm. to studying going over you know thinking about what about the subject and mm -hmm. working on that uh, you know I'm, I'm looking at some of the the reviews for Bayou Moon um, and some of your other books on Amazon and you just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of really great reviews. Did you ever imagine that you would be a published author of 16, soon to be 17, 18 books um, with, I don't even know how many thousands of copies sold. Did you ever see that for yourself? No way. I, I, I didn't think, uh, it took me a while to even get to the place where I would let in. I, I wrote before, but, you know, letting anybody even read what I'd written. Uh, mm. So, yeah, that, um, yeah, I never imagined anything like that. I had a had an experience writing the, uh, the Moon series because um, I started off doing that. And, and to me, uh, my characters are, are real people. Um, they only they only live in my head, but really, I mean, well, they live on pages, I guess now. But uh, to me, they're real people, and I think about them, you know, in terms of them being real people. You know, how the, how are they going to react in this situation? What are they going to say if somebody says this to them? And uh, I wrote uh, three books in the Moon series, and uh, I started getting people emailing me and. Uh, messaging me commenting on facebook the the um the sort of the hero of the series his name is ed landry and uh people began to write to me and say we're really worried about ed uh he never seems to get the girl i thought i thought i was the only one that he you know thought of him in terms of a real person but here's the <laughs> yeah. so of course the fourth one i did he 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 finally got a girl oh man so, uh we well, kind of introduced him. that <laughs> yeah <laughs> but you know the that idea that other people would think about it in that in those terms was just i i still have a hard time believing that you know that like i said for me it doesn't seem strange but for other people to do it that now that's that's more than i thought about well it's a testament one of the things to too uh, about the the paranormal books that i do um the fellow that read the first, uh, uh, actually the, the death rides, the red river and, uh, Bayou moon. Uh, he, he narrated the audio books for those. And he said, you know, the, the reason that I like your books are that like Bayou moon. Yes. It's got a, it's what's called a Rougarou, which is a Cajun werewolf. It, it's got the Rougarou in the story. But the story's not about that. The story's about the moral dilemma that the sheriff has dealing with mm. uh, where this thing came from and how to keep people safe from it. Mm. And he does he does have a moral dilemma in the story. And uh, actually, he, as we, as he drifts through the series, uh, it kind of it kind of works out that. And he hasn't really accepted the idea yet, but that he's he's called of God to do this. 
uh, you know, just to uh, to defend people and people come to him for help and they're really strange things that happen to him. And he's, you know, he's at the point where, why does this keep happening to me? Mm. And his girl that he found said, well, maybe it's supposed to. Maybe that's God's plan for you. Do you do you feel like you were supposed to be an author? Do you feel like you are, you are fulfilling God's mission for your life in writing these books? I think so. Yes, that's been one of the changes. I like I said I I do do some Bible teaching now, but I don't pastor anymore. I've done that. I've been a missions minister and different things. But I actually think yes, that's that's the direction that uh, I was eventually meant to go in. Jack, have you seen a change or a development in your re- personal relationship with God as you have transitioned into being the author that you are today versus early on in your faith walk? Yes, I, and I think it's, I don't know, I, I feel like it, it's it's a deeper walk in that it's, it seems to me, and this, I, I don't know, kind of, it's kind, of, kind of strange, and I don't know if I'm explaining it right the right way. It actually seems more personal, mm-hmm. um, more um, intimate, more friendship yeah. um, than at the beginning. I was literally in church last night. My friend TJ was teaching, and he was saying when people get saved, early on, it— you know, it, it feels like we're just a servant. Like, you know, whatever you say, Lord, I just want to serve. I just want to serve the Lord. And then there, over time, we we grow into this identity, understanding of, of who we are as children. And then the, the, the culmination of our relationship is Jesus said, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends because a, a servant doesn't know what his master's plans are, essentially. Right. And, you know, so it just, it sounds like as you've been walking forward in what God has called you to do, you're just the, the culmination of what I was just being taught, you know, a little over 12 hours ago at our local church down here in Fort Myers. So, um, thank you for sharing that. It's, I know that's a a very personal question, but I think it's, uh, something people need to hear. It's one thing that, again, I, I picked up from C.S. Lewis's writings, uh, he was talking about differences in Christian thought and, you know, some other religious thought. And the, and his point was that as a Christian, rather than becoming lost in everything, we become more uniquely ourselves um, than could ever be possible. Mm-hmm. We We find what that, you know, thing we were meant to do and I said it, it develops into more of a friendship, um, just a deeper walk, and we really become unique. You know, the thought is, you know, in some religions, you know, you just like you be you become part of God, which is true in yeah. Christianity as well. But the idea in some of it, you know, it compares to like, and and people in those religions will tell you the same thing. It's like you're a drop of water that's added to the the sea that's God. And he mm-hmm. says, "Well, that's fine, but when when the drop of water enters the sea, it's lost. It's no longer the drop anymore." And yeah. if that's not the way with Christianity. Christianity, you become that drop becomes more unique than it ever was. Mm-hmm. I love C.S. Lewis, man. He that that gentleman was a thinker for sure. Oh yeah, Very wow. Much, but, and that's kind of the thing I found. You know, I think I've become more uniquely myself than a, you know, with the writing than I would have otherwise. Mm -hmm. How does that make you feel um, leaving this legacy to your children and grandchildren um, for perfect strangers all around the world? How does, how does Jack feel at the end of the day, knowing that he's had this impact so far and really no telling on how much further this will take you in the future? Well, I I don't know that I really know how to handle it well, because <laughs> I don't, when I look at me, I don't see anything special. Uh, I had some friends that uh, they said, we want you to write your life story. 
I said, no, I don't want to do that. That's that's boring. Nobody nobody wants to read that. And I said, oh, yeah, we want to read that. But no. Finally, they, they eventually talked me into it. And I actually, I published one copy. I, I self-published one copy and mailed to them. And they said, you know, <laughs> we really like it. You should rewrite it and change the names. And I said, no, there's no way that's going to happen. Oh, man. Uh, I said, but you've done all these exciting things. And I said, I don't think so. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think that I've done exciting things or done anything that, you know, anybody would really want to, uh, you know, look up to or whatever. I'm just, just plain as can be. Just imagine. And I, I was given, my parents gave me a copy of a biography of C.S. Lewis called Jack's Life. And I think it was written by his stepson, if I remember correctly. 20 years mm. ago when I was a new believer and I loved it because I have so much respect for him. Um, imagine today if he had self-published an autobiography and there was one copy in circulation, what would that be worth today? <laughs> well, probably quite a bit today, but yeah, I don't, I, I, don't I hope, I hope your friends are cherishing that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I did. I did have um, my editor was looking through. I think some old reviews of my book, looking for uh, looking through a, a, a website that handled a lot of out of print books or you know books that were written a while ago and not necessarily are around anymore. Mm -hmm. And my book that. Um, is titled Death Rides the Red River. I I wrote that and self-published it under a different title. Mm. Uh, and then when I got to working with the publisher, then I I they took over and and edited it and quite quite improved it. But uh, she came across a copy of that book selling in an Oklahoma bookstore for sixty five dollars. You got to be crazy to pay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, for one thing, the book's a lot better now that it's been edited and not, not me, but yeah, I, I said, I, I couldn't, she said, she, but you should, you go back to Oklahoma every now and then you should drop in the bookstore, um, and, you know, just take a look and at the book and see if it's, if it's really there still. Well, Jack, it's, it's such an honor to speak with you and to, be able to have this conversation and record it for others to enjoy and learn from. JackLaFountainAuthor.com has links to all of your books. It's got an about. There's a contact. You have a blog on there. Um, links to your books where we can even listen to audio samples. And then right. also HouseOfHonorBooks.com is your, your part owner of yes. this mm -hmm. publishing company. Can you tell us just a right. little bit about that? Uh, I actually got started in that. I I had submitted to a publisher here in Alabama, and um, they were working on the book, so basically they didn't go anywhere. And I had one of the partners in the publishing company come to me and say, "Look, let's let's go off on our own uh, and start a publishing company." And I I thought, well, what am I going to do? I don't. I'm not an editor. I'm I'm not, but. Okay, let's we'll do it. <laughs> I said, but you're going to have to do all the work. You're going to do the bookkeeping. You're going to do the editing. <laughs> but yeah, I'll, I'll help you out. I can supply you with a book now and then that you know you can publish. But uh, so we did that, and uh, actually, eventually, that partner retired and 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 left working, and I got a, a new partner that's editing and uh, doing the editing and things now. Um, but uh, I've, I've really come to enjoy it. Uh, like I said, we work with a lot of first-time authors, and for me, the the work that we don't we don't make a lot of money uh, as a publisher. Uh, for me, it's mostly a way of giving back and giving other people a chance to uh, get out there and be published. And of course, we tell our authors, you know, you hit it big. Uh, don't worry about us. You just go be as big as you can be. Um, mm -hmm. But we'll, you know, we just remember us that, you know, tell somebody every once in a while you find some beginning author that looking for a break, just, you know, tell them about us. 
think I think you guys are having such an impact. I'm looking at the House of Honor books dot com website and you've got newsletter free stories audio stories where people can listen to some of the works from different authors um several authors i mean it looks like maybe 20 just scanning this list that have submitted works already that you guys have published you're doing great things and it's so <laughs> much fun to to talk with you and to think about all that you've done already do you have any plans for the future that you haven't uh, shared with us yet? Well, my one of my biggest plans, I'm going to, um, the plan is, the plans don't always work out, but the plan is, after the first of the year, I'm going to, and I get this Man of God book done, I'm going to concentrate more on some marketing and things for our other authors than doing so much for me. Like, the last couple of years, I've I've written anywhere from five to eight books a year. And it's like this year we're not doing, and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to concentrate more on marketing for these other folks. Uh, I can't give up writing altogether. Like I said, that's, that's what I do. So, uh, yeah, but I will, you know, be spending more time on marketing and working with authors. And some of the authors that we've got now that are on their second book with us or third book, We've got a couple. Um, I, I've already told them I, I'm I'm getting a lot tougher with you as the editor, and I'm not helping you out with telling you this is how to do it. Or you know, uh, I'm sending more back to you and say, come up with a different idea here, or come mm -hmm. up with a different word, come up mm -hmm. with. Uh, so hopefully, and I apologize. I apologize to them in advance. Said, look, I'm doing this because I want you to grow, not because I'm being mean in my, in my old age. You know? <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Jack, thank you so much for your time today. It's truly an honor. Everybody can check out your works at jacklafountainauthor.com, houseofhonorbooks.com. Any other closing thoughts that you'd like to leave with our audience for today? Uh, no, I've just had a great time being here. And like I said, uh, hope everybody will, you know, take a stop in, take a look at the man of God. Uh, I think you'll like it. Uh, Absolutely. Make a great Christmas gift for, uh, Christian teens and for anybody else who just enjoys Christian fiction, I would say. Yeah. And I do have the one, uh, I did write one nonfiction one. Um, I tell people I was kind of, uh, Paul says he was apprehended when, you know, the Lord uh, kind of apprehended to write this one. It, it's called Experimental Christianity, and it's about living Christian faith mm. more than believing it. Or Amen. beyond believing it, I guess I should say. Believing it, yes, and putting it into, experiment with it to see how it works. Because and that it bothers me sometimes when pe people outside of Christianity talk about you just believe everything and swallow it whole and that no we don't yeah we never do that yeah. we've never done that we hear something uh we think about it if we think it's the truth we might and we believe it's the truth then we do something about it we act on it yeah, yeah. and that's a, that's that's scientific method in a nutshell and that's kind of the the basis of the book I I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here. I had a great time.